Hey, what's going on everyone? I'm Mike Lowe, and I'm fighting a head cold, so I'm going to sound like a Martian on this episode, but we are here for episode four, and we're at the end of the season. I did go through and finish the season, but it was just a lot of more of the same. I didn't need to show you guys every little highlight and things like that. I mean, I have some clips I'm probably going to play here, but just... I wanted to show the schedule of integrity. I'm really proud of this. We played every single game just once. I did not back out of them. I didn't reset any of these, but we had some really ugly losses. I mean, we finished the season four and 13. We're gonna pick in the top five. It could be any of those uh, spots in the top five because there were five teams that all finished four and 13. So it'll be interesting, interesting to see where we're gonna be. I can tell you that I want to trade down. If I have my way about it, we're gonna need to trade down. We're gonna talk about this a lot in this episode, but this team, probably the scariest part of this four and 13 team is that it might get worse before it gets better. And when we look here, cap space is not looking great right now. Next year, when this starts to roll over, I mean, we have some, we have a lot of guys getting raised. Like look at Derek's car's raise here. Look at Ramchek's raise. Look at Lattimore's raise. Jordan gets a raise. Kamara, $10 million raise. $9 million, almost $10 million raise for Taysom Hill, who's just like 74 overall second th string tight end, who's 33, so hopefully he retires. DeMar Demario Davis is getting a $9 million raise. I mean, look at these raises. What is going on with this team? We don't have the space for this. We're going to have to trade down. We have to make some moves with this team. So... That's going to be a big focal point. I do feel like that's one of my strengths in these games is kind of balancing the financial side. But wow, this is a huge challenge. And so we're going to be talking a lot about that today as well. Of course, we're going to be looking at scouting players and, and just kind of going through our plan outside of just wanting to trade down. But if we had to pick and I had my pick, it would probably be Tyler Bernard, even though we had a decent offense. Our offense was in like the top 12-ish range. Derek Carr did not have a good season. He had probably the worst season of his career. But um, a lot of that was me just kind of forcing him to be what he's not, which is kind of like a middle uh, accuracy guy. And that's just that's his weak point. And so um, I, I was not really utilizing his short passing skills as well as we could. Our offensive line was not good. And Bernard just looks like he'll be a really, really good player. So if we did stay in the top five and this guy's here, even though he's 23, this is a guy I would absolutely grab. I think he's going to be a complete stud. I, I would have really no hesitation to pick him, even though he's only 55% scouted. Quarterback, not that it's not a need, especially if we are somehow, I don't know how it financially it's even possible to move Derek Carr, but we would need a quarterback. But I don't really love any of these guys. I, I don't want to have low deep accuracy. I don't really want to have low mid. I don't want any accuracy that's below B. It's it's just too, it's, it's necessary on the way, how difficult these sliders are on all Madden. And so I, I don't love any of these guys. I mean, Elliott's a nice, um, you know, he can move. He's got some athleticism to him. He's pretty quick. He's just 21 years old. You can see a lot of great to elite skills there. But I don't know. I like that he looks like he'll be a very health, healthy player, which is good. He can throw under pressure. He can throw on the run and so on. So I don't know. I, I just worry about that medium accuracy. And granted, it'd still be like an 80 probably, but I don't know. And then you got Jermaine Stanton who... I think one um, like quarterback of the year in college or something like this. So he's got a pretty good arm, but that deep accuracy is not great. So that's a little worrisome. The injury rating a little worrisome. But the point being is like if I don't love a quarterback, I don't really see the reason to take him. And then these other guys here in the top five just don't really know enough about. I also haven't decided if I'm going to be going through an editing position. So, of course, we don't need a right tackle, but would Red fit in at left tackle for us? Potentially, but that C pass blocking is really not what I'm looking for for a team that got sacked a billion times. It averaged about three sacks a game this year, which really crippled our offense. Marco Hood, I like. I don't mind a power rusher, even though he's not a scheme fit. At his size, I'd rather he be a speed rusher. He would definitely be more of an end for us, but he's really undersized for an end. So... Again, just not a really good fit. There are a lot of players here in the, kind of the round one area. So like pick six through you know 18 or 20 or whatever it is. There's quite a few players here that I like. Some players we even have fully scouted. Um, and there's just a variety of different positions that I do like. Eric Elliott, speed rusher out of Michigan State, I like. Oh, let's see. Paul Crockett is another end a little undersized. He's an outside linebacker. He'd be an end for us, but I think he could still be okay. 
Anthony Lacey is a nice power rusher with really good size on him, who's 100% scouted. So again, these would be safe picks here, but I don't know. What if you have the first pick? Do you, do you grab a guy like this? I worry about that a little bit. But certainly if we trade down, that makes sense. Some corners that I like. I really like Melvin Turbin because there's not a lot of um, defensive tackles. And oh my gosh, we need a defensive tackle on this team really, really, really bad. So anyway, I could go on and on. There's tons of players here. We're going to talk more about that as we get into it. Just wanted to kind of give you a, a quick lay of the land. But guys, I can tell you defensively, this was one of the worst teams in NFL history. We weren't the worst, but we were pretty close. I posted my stats up in Operation Sports. If you want to see them, there's a thread that I have going that kind of follows some of the I guess more intricate intricate parts of this dynasty. If you want to check those out, you can. And yeah, I, there's just really not a whole lot to, to say other than just it, we just weren't good. We were way worse than I, than I thought. I thought we'd honestly be a playoff team, and especially with how bad our division is. And we just, oh my gosh, I mean, it just did not play well. Our defense is just porous, absolutely porous. Some of it's my bad play. Some of it's just, uh, you know, getting behind on the momentum meter and that kind of thing. And it was really, really tough. But I'm telling you, the toughest thing with this team is going to be what I talked about before, the financial side of it. And the last thing I can say before we start diving into that is I've kind of made the controversial decision to not fire anyone on my staff. As ridiculous as this season was, I'm the new owner. I, I feel like we just need a little bit of time to kind of sort things out. I think we're going to come in already at an advantage next year, despite being a little bit more comfortable with playbooks and things like this. So we're going to kind of do our best to just really keep things moving, hopefully in the right direction. Uh, you can see here the playoff schedule, which I'm going to be simulating now to get us into the off season. But um, of course we didn't make the playoffs and it's a disappointing year when, like I said, it could get worse before it gets better here with the saints, but let's get through the playoffs and we'll start diving into the off season. Well, the season is over, and we have a pretty big surprise for the Super Bowl champions. It's the Carolina Panthers upsetting the Kansas City Chiefs with a rookie quarterback, Bryce Young, winning a Super Bowl in his first year. Miles Sanders gets the MVP. You can see the yearly awards there for the 2023 season. Nothing too surprising there. And yeah, just a, a fun season overall. I was glad to see. I know a lot of people have said that Dallas always wins and the Chiefs, so this was kind of cool to see. Yeah, my Lions were the number two seed, if anyone's curious. They made it into the second round, lost at home to Carolina, so the eventual Super Bowl champions. No huge surprises around the league as far as retirements go. I did see Aaron Rodgers retired. And we have three retirements here. Backup center, who we just signed throughout the season. Not a huge loss there. Andre Roberts, same things. Uh, did a nice job as a kick and punt returner for us, but really not a huge loss. Cameron Jordan, a bit of a surprise after 13 years, he's gone. So our perhaps one of our, our bigger weaknesses has become even bigger in that uh, defensive end. So that really starts to put some of those DEs in play that we talked about earlier as far as maybe looking in the first round because we're, just, we're not going to have any money in free agency, it looks like, until we maybe get to creative and start moving some pieces around via trade. But losing Cameron Jordan definitely hurts. He was, pun intended, hurt a little bit this year as well. So maybe it's not so big. Maybe it will free up some money for us a little bit. But probably not going to be enough to really move the needle. We're still going to have a lot of work to do with that. All right, guys. It's time to work a little magic here because I've identified five players that we are going to be able to restructure the contracts of. And even a few players that we're going to be able to consider releasing or at least release even right now. Uh, but certainly maybe later on as this team starts to develop its roster a little bit more. But we're going to be able to go from about $2.43 million in cap space to about 35.6. And it's a little bit of the old adage of kicking the can down the road because when you restructure, you're really just saying, hey, instead of paying you that money now, can I pay you that money tomorrow? And we're going to be doing that because we really need to. But I don't like that in a practice. I mean, from a business standpoint, it technically makes sense because if you can do that in real life, you're going to make interest on that money um, in your account versus someone else. So if, if someone ever offers you, that, offers you that deal, I would say don't take it. But here in Madden, we are going to do it. And the reason I've identified certain players and not others is for me, like a player like Marshawn Lattimore, who is, is on that list, he has three years on his contract. And so what's going to happen is, is it's going to bump down $9.22 million in cap space this year, and it's going to be divided over the remaining two years. So we're basically saying, Marshawn, instead of me paying you this 9.22, let's lower this down and we're going to split it here. Now, I plan on him being on the team. 
So I, I, even at 31 years old in a couple of years, I still think he'll be serviceable. He'll be very good still. So I'm fine with that. I don't like paying him, um, you know, 29 million, but the cap's going to be higher than it is today. So to me, it's like, would I rather pay him 25 million now or 25 million here? Of course, next year is going to be the challenge because it's going to really, really bump up his salary quite a bit, but it's something we're considering doing because it's going to help us here, especially this year, to get some cap space, which we're going to need to just fill out a roster. So Lattimore is on that list. He's going to be around. Similarly, Ryan Ramchick, another guy that makes a lot of sense because we can take his contract. He's got two years left, and we can say, okay, we're going to free up 10.6 this year. That will be broken up over five years. I still think he'll be here, and so we're going to lower this from 23. Next year, we're going to pay him 30. So what we got to be careful about, though, is we can't just keep doing this because we're going to now be running into cap issues next year. We still have David Carr probably on the roster next year because we just can't get rid of him. And guys, I looked, I can't. It's just, it's mathematically impossible. It's too big of a hit. We'd be taking a $46 million. I mean, even with the money I'm freeing up now, we'd still be like 10 to $12 million in the hole without a quarterback. So we just, we simply cannot do it. It's it's kind of wild. So Ramchek and Marshawn Lattimore, I'm planning to, but again, what I really need to be a little careful of here is just what that looks like in 25. Another player on the list is going to be Demario Davis, our middle linebacker. And he's a little bit of a different story. I think I passed him here. He's a little bit of a different story because he's got, again, two years. And so we can look and say, okay, yeah, we're going to free up 4.42. That's only going to be bumped down one year. We're just going to move that 4 million and down. And so that's going to lower it to 11. It's going to bump up to about 19 next year. But I'm not as worried about it with Demario Davis because of this. He's 35. He might retire after this season. So really, it's a way that I'm almost... I mean, we're, we're technically like stealing $4.42 million from him because that money, if he retires, won't be paid out. Now, it will be a problem if he stays and, and we extend or we restructure Lattimore and we restructure Ramcheck. But again, something I'm considering, if he ends up retiring, it's not going to be an issue there. Kamara is the next guy that we're looking to do this. And he's, again, a little bit of a unique situation. So he signed a three-year deal. It included a total of $22 million in bonus. So that's about seven and a half or so million in bonus money per year. That's why it would cost us $15.3 million to cut him this year. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Rest assured, though, unfortunately, Kamara fans, this is the last year he will be playing on this team. Because next year, especially when we bump this $4.51 million, he's going to be making you know, close to 34, right around $34 million a year. That's not happening for a 30-year-old running back. That's not happening for any running back on this team. So he will be gone. And so my understanding, at least I, at least I'm hoping, and I need to investigate this a little bit more, is that the restructured money is not guaranteed. It's base salary. And so we're just saying, yeah, we're going to pay you that next year. Don't worry there, Alvin. But really, we're going to end up cutting him, and we're going to be not paying him at all. We're going to basically pay him $7.5 million to go away instead of paying him $34 million to play halfback at age 30. So that's the strategy with him. And then that leaves one player who's not really highly rated that I certainly don't want to pay this much money to. And that's tight end Taysom Hill, who, for whatever weird reason, at age 34, got this enormous extension. He's going to be making 15.8 the next two years, but I'm really hoping that he ends up retiring. Not in real life, there's no way he would retire if you're getting that kind of money and you're not even that good. But I'm rolling the dice here. I'm really hoping that if we bump that $4 million back, it kind of drops his salary down to a somewhat reasonable amount. It's going to be a huge problem next year. So there is a lot. Admittedly, there's a lot of kicking the can to 2025. I'm a little worried about that, and that's why I'm not just ripping through and just doing these and just clicking OK on all of these. you got to think about it. There's no undo button. And an online CFM, when you advance, I mean, that's it. There's, you can't undo this stuff. So I'm really taking my time to think about it. There's a few players we're looking at releasing as well. Same thing, though, kind of really giving us some thought because we still need players on the roster. So I don't really want to play, pay Jawan Johnson $7 million. We can save five and a half by telling him to go away, but we still need tight ends. And so we have a 
massive financial issue here at tight end. So unfortunately, I, I mean, Juwan Johnson's not bad. He's got star dev. He's only 27. He's very serviceable, even at 7 million. I mean, a backup tight end or something, it's not, it's not awful, but it is awful when we look at just where we're at with this team in other situations. So unfortunately, I do kind of have at least a question mark next to Juwan Johnson. I may be cutting him. I won't do it yet, though, because I need three tight ends anyway. So we'll just kind of see how that looks. Um, one cut that I'm pretty sure we're going to be making is James Hurst. Again, not a bad player. 32 years old, 71. I mean, that's an interior guard who can who can technically start and do okay. But we're going to save $3 million here. And if that can help us kind of just balance out this team a little bit. I mean, I'm okay really going with a Robert Jones. I don't think Robert Jones is that much worse than a Hurst. And he makes a heck of a lot less money. This is another reason, by the way, why late round draft picks are really, really valuable. I know people want to just give those away and like, oh, you don't need fifth and sixth round picks and that sort of thing. This is where you get guys like this, though, who play super, super cheap. And if you look here, I like to kind of do this numbers game where I say, okay, one guy's 32, one guy's 25. That's a seven year difference, or let's call it seven point difference. I look here. Okay, what's the overall point difference? Well, it's only five. So to me, Robert Jones is like two points more valuable than James Hurst. And so that's what makes James Hurst expendable to me. We're going to look to get rid of him. And then the last player that we're considering, at least for now, removing from the team would be Peyton Turner. Again, kind of a similar thing, cost savings, 2.37 in savings. But it's, it's not a ton. Uh, it's just to me, it, it, I have a question mark on it because I got to see how the rest of the roster starts to kind of build out through, especially the draft. If we get another right end here that we kind of mix in with Isaiah Foskey, who used to have uh, star dev, but now he's down to normal. We had some we had some regression. We weren't a good team. It's not a huge surprise. And so we'll have to kind of see. But, you know, I, I want Foskey probably playing above him again for the same reason I talked about the point value. So to have a backup making $4 million, uh, that's a luxury we really can't afford, pun intended, to, to really make. And so... As I mentioned, having all of that, that could free up about $35 million. One of the things I'd like to do right now is to get our uh, Cesar Ruiz re-signed. We weren't able to do this during the years. We didn't have any money. We still don't now, but if we restructure some contracts, we would. And I think he'd be a nice player to bring back. He still has a star dev. And so that can make a lot of sense. So yeah, I, I mentioned we had some we had some star regression. I can just kind of go off memory here. David Carr has been downgraded to normal. I mean, it is what it is. He didn't have a great year. Well, Lave was upgraded to superstar, so that's awesome. He's going to be an even more explosive player this year, so really, really excited about that. And I know there's a lot of chatter about, like, oh, you should turn off, you know, dev regression. I totally disagree. I think Madden does a good job of this. We sucked. This team should have had dev, uh, dev regression. I mean, why would we be getting better? I mean, this team was bad, and so I kind of like that the game piles it on a little bit. I think it's pretty cool. Um, let's see, I mentioned that Foskey, unfortunately, our second round pick from last year in real life. Um, Brian Brezzi is also downgraded back to normal. So again, we have another pattern here of just, just overpaid, crummy backup defensive tackles that we can't do anything with. I can't get rid of these guys right now. 5 million, 2.7 million, 4.4. And our defense was terrible. Our run defense was terrible. 31st in the league. But I can't do anything here. It, it, it's not going to help us at all. It will hurt us to cut these players. All I can really hope to do is maybe get someone in the draft who can come in as DT1 right away. Or maybe there's someone in free agency, DT1 right away, who can just make a difference, hopefully. And maybe one of these guys start to just get a dev upgrade next year. I mean, it's, again, this is a long, long-term problem. Mario Davis downgraded, but he had a really good year. He was a top five linebacker, but he's just old. So that downgrade makes sense. And that's why, again, I think you leave those on. I, I have no problem with that. Uh, Abito, I hope, stayed star. Ah, shoot, he downgraded as well. So he is down to a normal dev. He was a guy I was hoping could kind of slot in to be our corner two this year, but it looks like he'll probably be a, a depth corner again this year. But again, quarterback, huge need. Um, we did get an upgrade with another player who had a pretty good year as well. Really just racked up a lot of tackles, but he was upgraded to star dev. And so um, actually it says superstar, and then it looks like he went down to star, so he stayed the same, so never mind. But um, nonetheless, I think what happened there, he probably got upgraded because he had a really good year, but then downgraded because of his age is, is my understanding there. And so those are some of the issues we're looking at here. Let's get into the next topic.
All right, so before we get back into the restructuring and whatnot, I do want to give you just kind of a lay of the land on things. I got some good sleep last night. I still sound like a munchkin here with my head cold, but um, we are just one. I wanted to just take some time to show you how the season went because I didn't want to just glaze over it. It wasn't pretty, but there were some things I think we can build on. So I'm just going to kind of go through and just show you how the, the NFL looked here in this franchise, Ravens, Bengals. We already know the, the Super Bowl champion at this point, but uh, Ravens and Bengals there make it out of the AFC. What is that? The North. Titans out of the South, Bills and Patriots made it out of the East, AFC West had the Chiefs and Chargers, Lions finally, first time ever, win the NFC North, Packers also get in the playoffs there, Vikings just miss, Panthers and Falcons from our division, of course there we are at 4-13, <clears throat> NFC East, Cowboys and Eagles, NFC West, 49ers go 15-2. And if you look at the kind of the, the draft order here, I mentioned there was, what, five teams all with the same record? Two, three, four, five. And we are picking fourth for whatever reason, however that worked out. Um, according to the latest mock draft, we have the fourth pick in the draft. And so we can also take a look around at some of the league stats and whatnot. So let's go ahead and do that. And again, uh, you know, 4,200 4, passing yards was fourth. In the league, 13th in touchdowns, but a 70.3 rating. I mean, it's not pretty. We can just kind of start with with that. 24 touchdowns, 18 interceptions, but 50% completions. I had so many, just like, he's so bad at medium throws, or at least with where the accuracy is, that like curls and stuff were almost impossible to throw. And so a lot of it just took some adjusting. But this, this guy actually got worse as the season went on. And... It's been tough. Um, there's a lot of those throws where I'm like about to be sacked, but he'll throw out of it. And I mean, there's like four or five of those a game, it seems like. And so, of course, that's going to hurt your completion percentage. I do throw the ball away sometimes if I can. But nonetheless, I mean, it was probably his worst season of his career for Derek Carr. Um, and again, that's that's me. That's that's my bad. I mean, this is worse than uh, his rookie year when he had a 76.5 rating. I mean, this is just, you know, if you look at the peripheral stuff, it, it's not too far out of line. Um, it's the most interceptions I believe he's ever thrown in a year. So again, not a huge surprise there as I continue to learn and try to get better. Sacked 54 times, which actually wasn't the uh, NFL lead. I think Cousins had more. But I mean, 50%, he's never been anywhere near that, even as a rookie. And so yards per attempt was also down. So again, just strange to have that, um, to have this low and this low as well. It, it's just really, really strange. So just kind of a weird year for him. Um, you know, you look at his rushing attempts again, kind of open that up a little bit here. Um, just kind of taking what they give us. And so he was running a lot more, but eight fumbles. I mean, that's got to stop. Like we led the league in fumbles and it's because of him, um, slash me. So again, just, uh, wanting to show that and be transparent on that. It wasn't pretty. I did not reset any of the games. Kamara, because he was hurt for probably five, if not six weeks, they ended up just kind of splitting carries, and they both did well. And I wish if we could, I mean, I love Kamara on the team, but if we could remove that contract somehow a year early, I would, because I think we're fine with Jamal Williams, and you can kind of see it here. They were very, very similar players. But, I mean, this is going to be our bread and butter. It has to be next year, because we're, we just we have to run the ball, and I have to be disciplined to stick with it. So you can see the rushing stats they're receiving. Really nice year for Chris Olave, who got the bump up to superstar, 1,100. Yards, 18.4, 10 touchdowns. I mean, that, that's a great year. Um, if we go in and look at his kind of breakdown here um, from his rookie year, he had less catches, but a big bump in reception, um, average uh, catch yardage there, even though his game yardage was down. So pretty interesting there. Um, and again, that just comes from just getting less looks, but when they are there, they're just being explosive. And you can see that they're uh, more than double the amount of touchdowns. And so... Um, yeah, he's just he's just turning into a much more explosive player that will probably get featured a little bit more this year. But again, really, really trying to stick with the run. Traquan Smith actually led our team in receptions. He was our slot receiver, but he got to play a lot because, of course, Michael Thomas was hurt so often. Uh, who's still on the team, who's still got one year left in his contract, and is still a player that I really financially can't afford to move. So he'll probably be here still. Uh, getting hurt every other week. 
But I do like Traquan Smith. He's not really a 73. I think he's more of a, yeah, like a 75-ish. And so I, I liked him. He's always been consistent. I love guys who can run decent routes, and he can, even even though they're down a little bit because of his morale. Um, he's a good player. I mean, don't let the 89 speed fool you. I mean, as a Lions fan, I can see that with a guy like um, Amon Ross St. Brown and so on. You don't always need blazing speed to get open. And uh, Smith's been a really good player. So he's on my list of you know potential re-signs. Kamara, 68 receptions out of the backfield, so he would have actually been our second leading receiver, and he was hurt a ton. So it's good we utilized him, but I probably need to be smarter about how we're utilizing him. Um, and that's got to be part of my game plan, like just to kind of salvage Derek Carr here, uh, is we really got to start making Kamara work, u- utilizing more of those uh, hot routes that he has access to and things like this that um, yeah, I you know admittedly wasn't using as much, so... Um, And I'm talking about this one here. So players with this ability have access to four additional hot routes during pre-play adjustments. I did a little bit of it, but you're in the heat of the moment there in the game. You just, you tend to forget sometimes. So Michael Thomas, again, not a bad year. Just can't stay healthy. And uh, Taysom Hill, for whatever reason, started taking over at tight end more in the year. He was actually pretty decent, but again, certainly not worth the price tag. Uh, We get very, very similar production on Juwan Johnson, who I'd be fine keeping if we didn't have to keep Taysom Hill financially. So um, Robbie Chosen, again, uh, very minimal playing time, but he's a guy I'm also considering keeping for some depth. He he did his role well, which was just kind of running deep. And again, something we could look to work in to the game plan more. Um, we got sacked a lot, as you saw. A lot of that was from Cesar Ruiz, who is probably the top candidate for re-signing. But it, it begs the question, like, should we? I mean, we got sacked a lot up the middle, and there's just no time. We play some really good defensive tackles, um, we had to play Aaron, Ro- Aaron Donald this year and so on. And I mean, he, this guy got eaten alive. I mean, 70 pass block is terrible. It's really a 75, so it is serviceable, but like, he's got to get, we got to get this guy going. We got to get him happy. Um, he has a scheme fit. And so hopefully we can kind of just get some wins under our belt. Our division is still not great. So maybe it's possible, but he's the only one that I'm, I'm really concerned with. I mean, Trevor Penning, I mentioned left tackle is a position I'd love to upgrade, but he actually might work for us this year still because, again, he's a much better run blocker than he is pass blocker. And so um, just staying disciplined in kind of my game plan is going to be important to utilize guys like this where we're not trying to overpass too much. But we get behind so f- so quickly. We get behind so often that, I mean, we have to pass. And so just kind of looking at that. Defense, we had two guys rack up a ton of tackles and we're kind of considered top 10 players because of that. Um, again, the game doesn't really simulate tackles the same you see in real life like you don't really get a ton of assisted tackles in simulated games and so you can look at this though and it kind of gives you a good barometer but these guys were, were pretty high up on the list they weren't necessarily tops in the league surprisingly um oh yeah they were so uh, but again if you look here at just tackles i mean they're not even close right so it's just kind of a weird way that the game still just kind of just some of that tlc st- Excuse me, some of that TLC stuff I wish we'd see from the Madden team. Of just, I wish they would just focus more on franchise. I mean, little little details like that. Um, our sack leader was a, a defensive tackle who's like a 73 overall, 71 overall now. Um, I mean, that's kind of crazy. So when I say like D-line is our top priority, especially in the draft, I mean, yeah, it's got to be. I don't think we could afford to sign like a big, you know, pass rusher who's going to get a 16 sacks a year or something like that. So we got to start developing one. Um, interceptions, pretty realistic there. Uh, Marcus May had three, Lattimore the two, including a touchdown. And yeah, I mean, you know, just it's weird because like you look at this, like oh, it's not too bad, but like we just we didn't generate pressure. Teams could do whatever they wanted. We just were terrible at pursuit angles, and I, specifically me playing safety or linebacker. So we gave up big runs. It was just it was gross. I mean, really, really, really bad. Um, to show you how bad, I mean, we're talking. Uh, We'll get to the defense in a second. Our offense was okay if I just kind of rank by offense. I mean, we're in the top, you know, 10 or 12, whatever that is. Pass offense, of course, we had a lot of yards because um, we were losing so much. You can see us there at the bottom. Rushing yardage, um, again, probably middle of the league or so. Yep, right in the middle. Points per game was really low. So, again, we're moving the ball, but we're not scoring. And admittedly, some of that's probably being a little too aggressive on fourth downs. Um but it's not like we were losing by three or four points. I mean, we were losing by a lot this year. We gave up an average, I think I mentioned it earlier in the video. Uh, if not, I calculated it earlier in the video for myself. We gave up the most points in the NFL, and it was by 
eight points per game average more. I mean, we gave up per game, folks, per game. For over 17 games, we gave up an additional eight points than the second worst defense in the league. Like, that's insane. That's so bad. It's not historically bad, surprisingly, but it's bad. Um, we were at kind of the bottom for rushing touchdowns, and I tried to balance that out, so that was just kind of how it happened there. Um, a lot of audibles around the goal line, things like things like that when I'd see something open. Uh, a lot of first downs. So here's where it gets really ugly. Total defense. We are 700 yards worse, over 700 yards worse than the second worst defense. So keep that in mind. It's not like I'm saying, oh, we're 700 yards. It's not bad. That's just from the 31st worst defense. I mean, that's, that's terrible. Pass defense, worse than the league. Almost not, but still worse than the league. Rush defense, second worst in the league. It's bad. Points, 140, basically. Almost 140 points more. So as I said, eight points per game more. It's unbelievable. Sacks, we actually did okay. And it's maybe because the simulation doesn't generate enough sacks. I mean, we spread them out. That, that doesn't even look like it's that big of an issue, but we just didn't seem to have like game-changing sacks. Fumbles doesn't record right still. Stupid. This unbelievable. They haven't fixed that yet. Interceptions. Again, we could probably use some more, uh, creating some more turnovers there, but that's not really the reason why we are so bad. Um, some of those were user INTs as well. Um, conversions. I mentioned I went for it a lot on fourth, by far the most in the league, but that's by design. Um, that's just kind of using more of those advanced metrics. And we were okay at it. I mean, 48%. It's not terrible. Um, third down attempts. We have a ton because, I don't know, we're just not doing enough on first and second down, I guess is what I'd say there. 40% is not bad, but it is when you look and see that you are the second worst in the league. And so um, these numbers are probably a little high. You can even hear the announcer in the game say the league average is around 40%. Um, those, are, those are pretty high. Two-point attempts, we were four of eight. Penalties, of course, we're going to be dead last. Turnovers, we had the worst differential, uh, mostly because some of this stuff doesn't count right. Um, but still, we fumbled way too much. I think we led the league in fumbles lost because, um, and again, this doesn't even add up right because we saw Derek Carr. Well, I guess it doesn't mean he lost them all. He fumbled eight times. But, yeah, lost six of them, 24 giveaways, 18 picks. Takeaways, we were kind of towards the bottom-ish. Yeah, so, anyway... That's kind of a look just kind of around the uh, the league at what's been going on there. Um, what else can I show you? Let's see. We saw the MVP and that sort of thing. But, yeah, I mean, that's, I just wanted to kind of give you a look, and I didn't want to just glaze over it. We, we did have an entire season. Right? We played every single game, and it wasn't pretty. So if you got questions on that at all, just let me know. Let me know how your, your franchise was going in the chat as well. I'd be curious to hear. But that was a look at mine. Let's get back into the financial side of things. Well, I misspoke earlier, and I may have edited it out of the video, but I'll just say it here anyway. But I was under the impression that when you restructured, that additional money that was kicked to the remaining years of the contract was not guaranteed, but it is. It will be added. I did it in a test franchise. It'll be added to the bonus. And so that really changes a lot because that's far more than just kicking the can down the road. And so that's really going to kind of limit who I'm willing to even consider this with. I'm still consider excuse me. I'm still considering it with Lattimore and Ramchek because I see these guys as still being on the team for their contracts. Even if they are going to be a little overpaid, we could free up some salary here. These guys are rated high enough. They're at very important positions. I don't ever see myself getting rid of them in this contract that they're currently in. I would consider still doing it with Demario Davis simply because I'm rolling the dice that he will retire after this year, and I won't owe him that money. That money will go away. So I'm kind of leaning towards taking the risk there. I've changed my mind on Kamara. I'm not going to restructure him because that bonus, I'm going to be cutting him for next year. We're going to be able to save a ton of money. And if I restructure it, it will save us some money now, but it's going to cost us a lot more money next year when I try and cut him. And as much as I like Kamara, as I mentioned, I just can't pay a running back that much money. So um, a couple little changes there. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is still struggling here. But a couple changes there. Uh, but other than that... Yeah, let's start making our first moves. 
not making any trades yet because the trade window is still closed, it looks like, at this point of the offseason. But Marcus May is a guy I'm willing to move. I think the savings would make some sense. I think I could even just kind of manually control a strong safety all year, even if he's like a 68 overall. Maybe do okay. Uh, so kind of sell while he's high. He was a, a top defender, um, quote unquote. <laughs> and so just it would make some sense to kind of free him up. I probably will keep Matthew for now. But same thing, you can make the argument there that maybe we... We look to move him as well to free up some money. So we'll see what maybe the draft, we unlock something there. I, I think I'm going to change my tune on Jawan Johnson. I think I'm going to end up keeping him because there's still some value here. I don't mind paying a $7 million starting tight end. And I think at 75 with star development, I think that's fine. I think he can be okay, uh, at least as a holdover. Maybe we, if we get a, a rookie or something like this, we can um, do some different things. I'll also consider moving him. It wouldn't be the worst thing. We are pretty short on draft picks. I think we only have like five picks or so and like only a first and second. And then there's like a gap to like the fifth round or something. So we'll see. There are some options there. So we are going to restructure Davis, as I said. But the first thing I want to do is I'm actually going to cut Taysom Hill. And it's a bit risky because it's going to take an $11.6 million penalty. But we are saving 4.21. And so you might say, well, that doesn't seem a lot of sense because you're still paying a ton of money here like yeah yes we're still essentially this is costing us 15 million why not just keep them on the team but i look at it as can i find a backup tight end for less than 4.21 million yes i can he's 34 years old um i, I just can't pay him 15 million dollars and so that's kind of the thought there i didn't want to restructure it you can make the argument that we could restructure and bring that down um to 11 million or so, but that's still too much. I would just rather cut him and just find a backup tight end that's less. So we are going to go ahead and cut Taysom Hill. He's the first transaction here that we're making. It's going to cost us a little, but he needs to go. Next, and for the reasons I already have mentioned, we are going to restructure Demario Davis. We're going to roll the dice that he will retire at the end of the year. And so we'll see what that does. Um, Let's see if we can find him again just to kind of see what that looks like. So he's now down to 11.4, but next year is a little bit scary. But even if we had to cut him, you know, I think the bonus, it's going to be, we'd still save 10 million by cutting him next year or so. So we'll see. We're going to have that option. But for now, I think that makes some sense to restructure Davis. Next, we're going to be cutting Peyton Turner here. We basically have the same player in Foskey. He is younger. Don't need two, which I consider kind of backup ends, maybe maybe at best developmental ends. And it doesn't save a ton of money, but hey, we'll take it. So we're going to release Peyton Turner here, free up another $2 million. And again, I just feel like we can find a backup for less, uh, whether that's through the draft or wherever else. Finally, we are going to restructure Lattimore because it's going to free up $9 million. So we're going to kick that money down. I don't love doing this, but we just... We just need to. I mean, next year is going to be a bit of a problem, but I still think he's worth this kind of money. I mean, it's high. Don't get me wrong, but it frees up some money this year so we can actually fill out this roster. We're going to do the exact same thing with Ramcheck here. We're going to restructure his contract, bump another $10 million down, and that's probably going to be it. We freed up about $36 million. It's not quite as much uh, because for whatever reason, and I haven't investigated this, why this is different, but when I go to negotiate... Instead of like 36 million, it's 22. But nonetheless, we have some money now to try and get Ruiz re-signed, maybe a couple others. Um, but we still got about, I don't know, close to eight or nine guys we got to get to fill out this roster to 53. I have my roster minimum at 53 for the league. This is why I like the challenge of it. So we still got some work to do. Adding in a quick note here, and I'm still sick, by the way, so uh, still sound ridiculous, but um, we were able to use some of that extra money we freed up to re-sign right guard Cesar Ruiz, and so that's what I'm doing here. We went through, sped up the video a little bit, but able to get him on a pretty good deal, I think. Uh, I think anytime you can get an interior guard with a lot of potential like he has, and we can keep it around that, eh, you know, six, seven million dollar range, which is where, right where we're at, about six million. I think it's pretty good. We added a year there to get him for three years, and we, we at least have another guard locked down. It's one less hole we need to fill, and it's one less problem we need to worry about. The last thing I was looking at before we advance here is, you know, do I re-sign one of these receivers or both? We got about $16 million. And by the way, I figured out, I just completely forgot. The reason that those cap numbers are different is that on this screen, it is keeping in mind the amount we're saving for our draft picks. So that's why there's a difference. We do have more than this, but it's kind of slotted away about $15 million. I'm hoping to lower that number because I would like to trade down, even though that would give me more picks. 
it would give me not the number four overall, which is going to cost a lot more than say like the 15th pick or something like that. So I'm still looking to consider at trading down, but as much as I like Traquan Smith, I'm going to pass on him. Reason being is he regressed a little bit, but that's not really my concern. I still like his ratings. I think he's a good fit. I love his traits. He's got everything I'm looking for in a receiver. But the 85 injury, he's right at that borderline. And so for me, $3 million, I mean, we, we still have to sign a, enough guys here, and that's a little bit over budget for where we should be spending kind of on a per-player basis. And it's just not going to work. It doesn't mean we can't or we won't later. But right now, there's no reason to commit to this right now because we just we need to see what free agency looks like. What if I draft a receiver with you know hidden dev in the third round or something like this? Um, I might want him to be our slot receiver instead. So we're going to wait on Traquan Smith. Robbie Chosen, I was a little bit closer to actually resigning because I do like him as, as a fit. I think he's the perfect guy to kind of sub in when Michael Thomas keeps getting hurt because he can run deep routes, kind of the opposite side of Olave, and just kind of run consistent deep routes and see if anything pops. But with him being 31 years old, again, it's just not something I need to rush. He regressed quite a bit. His injury rating's okay, but a lot of regression there. And again, maybe we look at it later on, but it just doesn't make a lot of sense to sign a 31-year-old receiver right now for about $3 million. So we're going to wait on that. We're also going to wait on the guard I mentioned um, because I just don't really know how when I use my auto uh, depth charts and whatnot, I don't know if they would start him at left guard, for instance, now that we've re-signed Cesar Ruiz, which you saw. So we're going to wait on that too. It doesn't mean we can't later, but at 31, there's really no reason to rush to be signing guys who are over 30 and things like this that are going to be potential depth depth pieces and, and things like that. So we're moving on. Let's get into the rest of the offseason. Okay, so let's talk free agency strategy. We're a team that's pretty bad. Not a lot of players want to sign with us. We're a team with without a lot of money. We also don't have a ton of draft picks. However, I still need to really think about my strategy with free agency. And what I'm looking for in early free agency are high-end talent players that are going to fill positions of need that are absolutely necessary. The reason it's important to say high-end talent only is because you're not going to find that in the draft. You're going to still find developmental players even at the top of the draft, even if they're going to be superstars. They probably won't be that first year. And so because of that, what I'm trying to avoid are players that would be, you know, they'd kind of clog up the depth chart a little bit. Like I don't want to go in and sign... Uh, a KJ Hamler or something like this, when I might find a second string receiver or a second round receiver, I should say, who might be like a, a 72, 73 overall, who's 21 years old. And so you want to be careful not to log jam yourself with those, uh, with your depth chart and kind of with what you're doing here in early free agency. So I'm looking at high end talent. And then another layer is I'm looking at high end talent that only the other teams are interested in right now. So I'm not interested in Keenan Allen for a number of reasons. We just don't have the money for him. But I'd be, he would be on my list because there is an offer out on him. Wagner's, there's, Wagner, there's not. And so although we don't need a middle linebacker, we have Demario Davis still, I would pass on him either way because there's no competition. I don't need to force this just yet. If I can get through the draft, there's going to be some players sitting around. Now, yes, the CPU teams will sign free agents before you do. But that's okay. I don't mind it. I don't mind letting maybe some trades come in and that sort of thing. The longer I can take the sign players, the better. I guess maybe that's the simplest way to say it. So I do have a couple targeted players. I have Devin Duner, uh, Duvernay at receiver. And truthfully, I'm, I don't even know if I'm going to keep this offer because it, it's pretty weak right now. There's a, a handful of other receivers that I like. But because I'm trying to trade Michael Thomas, he could come in and be a potential number two receiver, which on this team is kind of like our third or fourth option receiver. Or he could fit in and be a really nice slot receiver. And so either way, if I drafted someone, he's not creating a log jam. But I don't mind waiting because he might end up being a little bit cheaper later on. There's a little bit of competition with the Steelers, but with it being a yellow offer, I'm not super worried. He's also not super interested in coming here, so we'd be kind of going over on, on maybe the, the price we need to pay to get him. The player I will be letting kind of ride out because it's a huge position of need. He's still pretty young. He's still got star dev, uh, dev. And even if I were to draft another player just like him, I'm okay with it because we have next to nothing at defensive end after Cameron Jordan retired. We basically have Isaiah Foskey, and that's it. Like He's literally the only end on the team. And so I like to use a rotation. Huff's going to fit. I don't think his asking price is terribly high. He's really interested in playing here, too. And so that's kind of what we're going with here in free agency around one. We're keeping it really simple. I don't have a, a lot of money to be cute with anyway. So if we get this guy for about 7 or so, 7.8, and then around $6 million for Duvernay, I mean, that's only going to leave us under $3 million 
after my five draft picks, that's going to put us at 48 players. I still have to find five players. And so these guys would have to be dirt, dirt, dirt cheap filler players. And so if Duvernay says no, it's not the end of the world. We have some options. We also have some trades we're still trying to make. So again, just taking it slow, going step by step. The other players I'm keeping an eye on is, is fullback Ben Mason. I wouldn't mind getting a fullback, but I'd rather honestly draft one or even sign one for super cheap after the draft. Don't really have the room to spend $2 million on one. A couple other receivers outside of Duvernay that we do like that I think could be fits, and that's Kendrick Bourne. We're bringing back Jarvis Landry back to Louisiana where he used to play college ball at LSU, of course. He's pretty interested in coming back. The other option, and I just don't think we have the money for it because I think he'd be a really good fit, is Hunter Henry. But I don't know. We'd have to really kind of see some things play out. He's probably going to sign before we get a chance, and I have to leave that tight end spot open. There's some second-round tight ends that I think could be fits, and if it falls to us and there's nothing else there, maybe we grab one. And I'm okay still going with Juwan Johnson this year. Again, we can use Olave. We can use Kamara. We need to run the ball. So I, I don't have the luxury of spending a ton of money on guys that would be like third, fourth options in the offense. We just don't have the room. All right, so I'm excited. We do fill our biggest need by far. We get Bryce Huff. He's not going to be the a world beater or anything, but he's going to fill a huge need, and he hopefully can help our defense. But it's it's fair to argue he's no Cameron Jordan. So it's still a downgrade, but at least we, we give ourselves a little bit of depth here at the very least, and it's going to be something hopefully we can build around. If we look around the league at some of the other signings, Keenan Allen goes to the Bears, Michael Pittman Jr. to the Vikings, Hunter Henry does resign with the Patriots. I'll just kind of flip through some of the others here for you to take a look. Free agency stage two. We're only doing one thing here, keeping it pretty simple. I went ahead and just sorted by interest to see if there was anyone that just kind of fit that maybe we could kind of fly under the radar and get. And it led me to, is it Devon Godshaw? I think is how you say his name. We are going to offer him a contract. He played at LSU. I think we may be able to maybe get him under the radar uh, before other teams maybe take an interest. And we're going to go pretty low. Instead of the $6 million per year he wants, we're going to offer him around five and just see. He's probably not going to take it, but you never know. Depends how much of that interest. I do have the interest set to very high in the setting, so we'll see. But that's really it. Of course, uh, you know, fixing our defensive line is a, is a top priority. It's no secret, so it makes sense, and it still gives us flexibility for the draft. Well, this is a nice surprise. We were able to actually get Gottschall for that $5 million offer. So again... It really matters when you look at the interest level, and you can save a little bit. We only saved about a million, but still, that matters a big deal when we're looking at this team. So we're able to get a couple defensive linemen. You know, Please understand, this, this is not going to suddenly make us a, a Super Bowl contender or anything, but it gives us some depth at the defensive line, which we need. I think Brzee is probably going to end up playing because he's a day one starter player tag. So it gives us a couple options here, and it also doesn't handcuff us. We can still draft a defensive tackle in the draft. We could do the same thing at end. We have Foskey, who is going to at least be a rotation piece. And then, of course, we signed Huff. So we could certainly still use another defensive end there. So, so far, plugging some holes but not handcuffing us at all. Let's take a look around the league to see if anyone else signed. Bobby Wagner signs with the Lions. Just looking at Mike Williams there with Atlanta. Just looking up some new names. Gabe Davis goes to the Lions. The Lions are being active here. Michael Pierce signs. Our Eric Armstead signs, Ryan Neal. Stage three is going to be a case of sometimes the best action is inaction, and there's really nothing that we need to concern ourselves with too much. I mean, we're keeping an eye on a couple of those receivers, but I don't think it's anything we need to jump on just yet. No one's really shown interest in Bourne, who I like. Landry has some interest but hasn't signed yet, and I'm willing to take a chance there to see if these guys are still there after the draft. Might get them at a discount. Teams are going to start cutting players in the preseason and so on. And we'll know more about where we stand financially and just with the depth chart of this team after the draft. I mentioned I had some players on the trade block. We are now in the free agency review phase. And finally, we're seeing some trades from the league. I try to reflect that. I don't try to trade outside of when the other teams trade. And so... With that now kind of seemingly open, we do have some offers that I'm going to be examining for Jawan Johnson and Thomas. Thomas is almost a guarantee I'm going to move, especially if we can get some picks in this draft. Jawan Johnson, I'm not sure because we didn't sign anyone to replace him, and we've already cut Taysom Hill and things like that. So it's, it's a little bit trickier, but we can definitely try to explore some options here for Michael Thomas, who is just constantly hurt. And wow, we have a, a pretty nice offer from the Houston Texans for Michael Thomas, who... 31 years old, just can't stay healthy. Derek Stingley Jr. 
and they're giving us a seventh round pick. I wish it was for this year's draft because we could use some more bodies, but at this point, I mean, we're getting a starter. I mean, this is a player, if you were to pick him in the draft, obviously, he'd be the number one overall pick in the draft, basically, even at age 23. So this is kind of a no-brainer. I mean, there's some decent offers. I mean, I can just kind of flip through, and if you want to pause the video, you can see him. Um, the other one I would maybe even consider is Romeo Dobbs with the Packers, and then get that 24 seventh rounder. But I mean, again, there's just no question the Houston one's so much better. Um, there's definitely some good players. Like if we were a contender, I mean, Fletcher Cox came up, um, Levante David, which we needed a middle linebacker. But again, we're just how could we turn down this offer from the Texans? This is this is just a no-brainer deal, and it's one I think we're gonna end up making. As far as the offers for tight end Juwan Johnson, they're much more limited. Still tempted to make one, and if I did, it would actually be with the Lions here because I would get that late pick. We'd basically be cutting Jawan Johnson is what we'd do. We'd free $5.5 million, make us a little bit weak at tight end, but by taking on Stingley Jr., we're going to be having cap issues again. I mean, we need to fill out this roster, and so Broderick Martin is not a player we need. We have quite a bit of depth now at defensive tackle. Um, you know, if, if I would even consider doing the Amari Rogers trade if this was a 2024, but really... This is kind of like getting two players for one, and we're saving $5.5 million. But I'm not sure I want to do it just yet. I'm going to give it some thought. Well, here he is, another LSU Tiger coming back to New Orleans. Derek Stingley is the deal, and so it really helps our defense a lot. I, I love this move. I don't know why they made this trade. But nonetheless, uh, they did, and I have trading on very hard, so I don't even feel that bad about it. I just I try not to dissect why the teams are doing it. I mean... It, crazier things have happened in the NFL, so we'll take it. That player could have been disgruntled. You can come up with any story you want. This obviously leaves us very thin at receiver, so something we got to keep an eye on, but that's okay. I'd rather work on the defense, honestly. I'm really excited about that deal. I decided to go ahead and pass on the Jawan Johnson trade just because we would be switching out a body for a seventh-round pick, and it just doesn't make sense. It does save us some money, but I don't think right now it's best that we just pass on that deal. So where does this leave us on the eve of the draft? Well, I mentioned earlier in the video, if he falls to us, it's going to be really hard to pass on left tackle Tyler Bernard. This guy looks like he could be a generation, generational player. Left tackle is a need for us. Maybe not immediate, but it's going to be for sure. And as much as I want to address our terrible, almost record-setting bad defense, you can't pass on the best player in the draft, in my opinion, if he falls. I don't think he will. I think he's going to go first overall, but this guy looks to be a stud. So that's kind of our first strategy. The second strategy is there's a couple linebackers here that are that have kind of been falling around the top five. We got Rich Anderson, who I don't think is going to be there. It looks like he's going to go third just before us or so. Um, doesn't look to be a, a terrible player by any means, but I, I'm just not sure I'm sold on him. And I'll just kind of flip through. I like his strength. But with these outside linebackers who would be playing end for me, it's a little tricky to really figure out those rankings because they're being ranked for the outside linebacker position, not necessarily an end. But he has a lot of A's that have popped. He's got some B's. The concern here, of course, is injury. The other concern is I just don't think he'll be there. And so I like that he's a top five considered talent. We don't know that for sure. But usually these are pretty well in line with kind of the best players in the draft. Not always. There's always surprises. There's always busts. There's always diamonds and gems and that sort of thing. But the other players that we're looking at, and it would be a bit of a stretch because they're not considered top five and we're picking fourth. But I like Paul Crockett. We do have him fully scouted. He's six foot three, 257. So I'd like to see maybe a little bit more length with him being a speed rusher. 21 years old, though. He's got some pretty good metrics, especially when you consider these. some of these like acceleration is going to be even higher at the end position. But he's going to be a little undersized there, too. But he's got, I think, six A's that popped in the scouting, including injury. So he'll be available. He's not going to get hurt. So that's going to be nice finesse moves. I would have liked to see more of those C's maybe pop into a B, like, like power move or, or play recognition, even impact blocking, which can kind of help them getting off with block shedding and things like that. So I, I worry about this guy could get kind of muscled around a little bit, but I think when it's a pass rush situation, I mean, he's going to be, he could be a nightmare. The other player, kind of a similar mold, I guess, is Timmy Cousins. He is a power rushing outside linebacker from Oregon. I like his size more, 6'5", 251. You can look here at his metrics, again, as an outside linebacker, so it's not a one-to-one -one match with the defensive ends, but he didn't really test out as well, I would say, physically. But skills probably tested out a little bit more. 
And so you can see where this is a little bit tricky. He's got five A's and he's got a bunch that are still A, B range. So not even an A, C. I mean, that's really nice to see those A, B's. Those are going to be good scores. The concern here is injury. A C, where, where does that put him? Around an 85? That's that's the guy who's going to get hurt probably every single season. And that rating continues to drop as the player gets older and gets more nicked up. So I'm looking at those two guys. Knowing that they're they're not really top five picks, I've tried trading down. There's just nothing out there. They won't take a fair deal. I've tried with all the teams in the top 10 to get a fair deal using the draft comparison chart, the pick chart or whatever you call it. Can't get a fair deal here. So the other consideration I have to be making as a team picking in the top four, we have to consider one of these quarterbacks. As much as I don't want to, again, I want to address the defense, but you can't draft for need. You have to draft best player available and if I were picking a quarterback it's, it'd be coming down to two players it'd be Jerry Elliott here who is the improviser he's the athletic quarterback I talked about earlier 21 years old he's got some pretty good metrics again he's not one of these guys you see people posting on Madden Reddit of like you know generational QB talents or anything like this but I think he's going to be pretty good I worry about that medium accuracy but basically he's going to be another kind of David Carr build where we can use short passing Deep passing opens up, it's going to be there. He's going to stay healthy, which is always nice for a quarterback who can move. I love that he can throw well under pressure. And he has a quick throwing motion, which is huge. Um, and it, that's going to be a, a, a thing to consider for sure, because I had a lot of incomplete passes that were simply because I was getting hit as I threw. And I think some of that's just Carr has a, a slow delivery. I think I haven't actually checked. The other one is Jermaine Stanton, Stanton who believe excuse me, who I believe won the quarterback of the year. And he has a slow, elongated throwing motion, it says. So again, a little worried there. He's 22, so he's a year older. Field general, though, so he's going to fit our our uh, kind of our style of play pretty well. I'm a little worried about that good throw power. That's not something I love seeing. I like it to be higher than that, at least great elite is ideal. And he's got some good scores here as well. So again, the accuracy probably looks like a, a little bit better profile with that me, uh, medium being a B. But injury rating is going to be a little scary with him in that B to C range. And so it might not be terrible. The other thing is here, I just don't think he's going to be there. I think he's going to get picked second overall. So I think Bernard, Anthony, and Stanton are all going to be off the board. It's probably going to come down to do we take Jerry Elliott or do we take one of these outside linebackers because it doesn't look like we're going to be able to trade down. But that's going to do it for this episode. As we look at the final mock draft here on the eve of the draft, let me know what you would do. You can see these top three players I just mentioned are slotted to go. They have us picking Paul Crockett, who is, a, I think, a safe bet. The other guy, Jerry Elliott, falling to seven. Maybe they know something we don't know. And then Timmy Cousins there in the eight. So, you know, it, would it be a stretch to take one of these guys like Timmy Cousins, maybe? Perhaps, but to me, I, I'm of the belief that like if you have a guy you like, just pick him. I don't give a damn if he's like the 10th best player in the draft and you pick him fourth. He's not going to be there in the second round. Pick him if he's the guy you want. It doesn't matter where you pick him as long as the player is good and is going to be able to contribute to the team. So let me know your thoughts. Who would you pick? By the time you're seeing this, I'm probably going to have the next episode, which will be the draft, up on the channel. So be looking for that. But I'm Mike Lowe. I'm on Twitter at MikeLow47. I super appreciate you all checking out the videos and for subscribing and liking the videos. That's awesome. Interact with me. Let me know what you're seeing. Let me know how your franchise is going. And hey, I'm all ears on your advice for this. So let's talk. Let's get into the draft in the next episode. I'll see you then.